monitor in when they feel like it. I would turn the camera backward, bust them right there, boom. Free eraser. Nobody makes any mistakes. Yes, I'm the only one who makes mistakes. All right, what do we got cooking for today? All right, uh, we did combined loadings yesterday. Any questions? Um, I, I still don't like how we had like the negative. It was like um, the the normal stress plus um, it was the other stress. Like it, it was to, to Bobby and I it was just confusing how you, like you knew instantly if it was negative. Oh, okay. Positive. We had let's see if I remember the the loading was something like something very simple like that, right? Is that the one you're, you're talking about? Um, and the, the deal with the combined loadings is, is very straightforward uh, in that we can separate the, the two loadings, figure out the stress of each, and uh, then recombine them to get the stress. So we can make this into this kind of loading, which we studied the first week and leads to uh, stress. Um, that's uh, just that load over the area. And for this example, it's uh, obvious, I hope, that that's an axial load and will, will cause a stress pattern that would look like that. It's not actually uniform, but it's very close to it and we take it as such. And then we add to that the second load, which is a pure bending load <coughs> that we studied a little bit later. Now, this one, you, you might have to think a little bit more about to understand what part of it's negative, what part of it's positive that would go with that one. The, the stress calculation is um, the MY over I, but remember, when we very first developed it, there was a negative sign in there, and sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. That's because uh, with a typical bending load, we get both tension and compression in every single one of the examples. Because for that loading, uh, and as I believe it had a rectangular cross section, so at the neutral axis, we know that it's zero there and varies linearly above and below. But whether it varies uh, to compression above or compression below depends upon what the loading is and you need to look at that. So this type of loading would give us a bend something like that. So you have to look at that and say, well, if, if uh, uh, a beam bends like this, then clearly the top's going into compression and the bottom's getting stretched just by the nature of the curve that's made. Um, you could see it if you want that uh, an inside curve like this is going to have less distance to it than the outside curve will have. Therefore, the inside curve's got to get compressed, the outside curve's got to get stretched because the neutral axis stays neutral. Nothing happens to it and everything happens on either side of it. So on this, this type of example, with this type of loading, we know that the top was in compression. So if that's my tension picture, then I want compression to go the other way, linear through the neutral axis. So there's more tension there, compression there, and then the two superimpose over each other. So that's how I knew that uh, for the example I had, that uh, the, the uh, top one and the top one there are going to subtract. Okay. It's still going to be linear uh, because you've got two linear functions you're adding together. One just happens to be a constant linear, the other is a constant slope linear. Um, but then uh, you know then 
uh, it's just a matter of uh, which one of these is bigger. Is this bigger negative than that is positive? Or is this bigger compression than that is tension? Either way, you see it the same. And then once you know which one's bigger, and if I remember, the, the compression was bigger than the tension was by a little bit. So there's a little bit of compression left over, but then, uh, and then you can figure out what the, the two add together down here. So we had quite a bit of tension at the bottom, but then once you've got those two, it's just linear in between. And so uh, I think somebody even asked, so there's essentially a new neutral axis. And the only way to find out where this neutral axis is now is by figuring out that linear function and the slope and where you get a zero with it. There's no other way to find the neutral axis. Um, originally, we find it from the pure geometry of the cross section. Now it shifts because of the load, and you have to refigure it because of the load, not the geometry anymore. TJ, how you feeling? Good to have you back. Well, you're not very convincing. So, all of this was mysterious to you. Have you, have you been watching the videos? Yeah, there are a few of them. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know, I know they're, they're not uh, all that much in focus, so if you need details, just ask me or someone else to fill in. Because a lot of times we'll put up dimensions and stuff, and those I know don't show real well. But it's, it's really easy to figure out which one you're looking at and, and give you the, the dimensions and lows and the like. The, the specifics of it, if you can't see them on the on the video. Okay. Any other questions about that combined loading type stuff before we take our our next shift here? You may or may not remember. Several weeks ago, we looked at this thing called, uh, that uh, I guess we call the general state of stress. And so we took a nice elemental volume, <laughs> quite big here though, so we can take a good look at it. This is a, a little piece of, of some material under some state of stress. And uh, we can put a, a, an x, y axis on it just for reference. Doesn't matter really where it is. No, I think we put z typically out here for our purposes. X, y, z, right hand rule. Uh, so we've 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 come across uh, uh, these type of uh, elemental pieces before, and we looked at the loading on them. Uh, for example, uh, we might have had an axial load in the x direction that gives us a stress in the x direction. Could be compressive, could be tensile, doesn't matter which, I have to draw one or the other. So don't think that, that Axial loads are only in the in the uh, uh, positive x direction or or in the tension direction as I've drawn, and of course because of uh, uh, a force balance on it, we start to expect this kind of stuff uh, uh, would have a, a a perfect match mate in the back, and then we looked at uh, shear stress across the flat face, and so that's. That's uh, shear stress across that face. Remember what our subscript designation was that we use? On the X face in the Y direction. In that order. Um, we, we found shortly after that that it wasn't all that important when we got to it. And then of course there's one on the back doing the same thing in the opposite direction. I'm not going to draw all the stuff on the back. We'll just draw it on the, on the faces that are visible and uh, be done with it then. Uh, and I have to always pick one direction or the other. We can come up with any kind of loading that will reverse any one of these arrows at any time. Uh, but I have to put something. So then we have a stress 
could have stress in that direction. That's the X phase in the Z direction. And then on the top, we could have uh, some kind of uh, axial load in the Y direction that gives us a normal stress in the Y direction. So I'll just pick positive uh, to do something. And then we could also have shear across that face. So let's see, that would be tau. Y X, Y face, X direction. And then we could have a shear across that face there, tau, Y face, Z direction. And of course on the underside, the exact same thing mirrored for the most part. And then uh, uh, the last visible face here, we could have a positive, we, well we could have some load in the Z direction that gives us a, a uh, Z normal stress and we could have shear across that face. Let's see, tau, Z face, X direction, tau, Z face, Y direction. And then uh, on the back, we can have all that too. Now, you may remember then that we also simplified this to a two-dimensional picture, which was very useful to us because uh, we saw then, we saw then that, uh, that this whole business becomes a lot simpler. Okay, we, we expect, uh, the possibility of a normal stress due to some axial load in the X direction. We could have some axial load in the Y direction. And then we'd see these shear stresses along that face. I just happened to pick up Tau, X, Y, and on the back face, tau, X, Y. Those have got to be equal uh, for the force balance to work. And then to counter the moment those two cause, because that's a couple, then we needed shear across that face. And because the forces all need to balance and the moments all need to balance, we found that tau xy equals tau yx and so on anywhere else all these all these stresses appear. So we had tau xy there, tau yx there, and we understand now balancing the forces and balancing the moments that the order of the subscripts doesn't matter. All we need to know is that we have some shear stress that, has, uh, that is on the X face in the Y direction. We're going to have the same size shear stress on the other face in the other direction. So that made things a, an awful lot simpler for us. Um, so that we're, we're down to this much simpler two-dimensional drawing uh, from this cluttered maybe even a little bit confusing uh, drawing we would have had three dimensions. So things become a lot easier then. What we're going to answer today is given given a, an element stressed in this way because of some loading. Remember all of these stresses are caused because of some external load on, on whatever material it is we're talking about. Let's raise the question, well, what happens if given that very same loading, we don't want to look at an element that's conveniently oriented in the XY direction? 
given the exact same loading, what happens if we want to look at an element that's oriented in some other direction? Do the stresses change? Uh, well, we know they do anyway. If you remember, back in maybe the second week or something, we looked at this type of thing and determined that given a simple axial load, that's the very first thing we looked at, is just straightforward axial loading, that the maximum shear stresses occurred on a 45 degree angle. You remember doing that second week or so? Flip back to your notes, wipe off some of the cobwebs, some of the dust, some of the pizza stains. It's there. But that was for a simple axial load only. Now we're looking at a much more generalized load because we have not just axial load in one direction, could be in the other direction, and could be some kind of shear. Because we, since, since we did axial loads, we've now added torsion and bending, and I uh, uh, need to put all those things together. Uh, so we can have now, now we need to do the same sort of thing we did here with just an axial load to look at the, the off angle stresses. Now we're going to take a generalized load where any one of these could exist and any one could be in any direction and see now what happens if we're in an off angle direction with, with those kind of stresses. So we'll call that angle theta. That'll be our, our reference direction. And now we've got an element oriented with those axes. And now remember, the load has not changed. All that has changed is our chosen angle and how we're going to look at this. And now we have the possibility that um, these are very much different. Without changing the load, in fact, some can even turn compressive, depending on what the angle is that we chose. So just for the sake of illustration, I'll turn one of them around. Uh, it could be that we can even get to certain angles where an element oriented in that direction won't show any stresses of a certain kind. They can completely disappear, we'll see. So all of those are possibilities that uh, we're going to see here. So the prime will mean our off-angle directions. And I'll say it again because it's so important and so easy to forget. We have not changed the loading. All we've done is changed our reference viewpoint. Everything's the same. It's just instead of looking at things straight, now we're looking at things with a little bit of tilt to it. So it's sort of like you, this will maybe straighten up your world for how you guys feel on Mondays. You kind of come in looking like that. Kind of, Gosh, I wish Manning would let us lie down while we do class. That'd be, that'd be awesome if we could bring pillows in and kind of stretch out. All right, so now our question. No change in loading whatsoever. Now our simple question is, what are these off-angle stresses? And we're just going to write x, y. That represents anything, everything we're doing. We're not going to write y, x because we know all they're all the same. And uh, so we can just keep going here. Don't want to forget my punctuation. Question mark. What are those? What are those stresses? Well, that's what we're going to look at now. So uh, here's how we can get to it. We're going to to start with our 
with our, well, oh, sorry, let me put this back up real quick. I could stand to keep it there. That was our on angle stresses, if you want to call it that. And remember, it's the loading that decides the direction of any of those and the size of any of those. Uh, we drew an element with uh, that kind of loading yesterday with that bracket. So what we're going to do is take uh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that and combine them. So we'll take the two directions we already know and combine it with the tilt of our new direction. So we'll get an element that's like that, where this is our usual x direction, which is nice because we know what's going on on those faces. We know that those stresses exist. Also, we've got the shear stresses there. So that's the piece from our original orientation. Now we have a, a one face that will give us access to the other orientation where we don't know what these stresses are yet. That's what we're trying to find out. Let's see, uh, turns out, and you can, you can see it with a little bit of review there, that angle is our theta angle. So what we're going to do now is balance the forces, balance the moments, and that will allow us to solve for these unknown stresses. Uh, but we don't balance the stresses, remember, we balance the forces. And the forces are stresses times the area over which they act. So we're going to call this face DA. Uh, let me make it delta A. Not that it really matters because you've seen this type of thing before and these, these all end up canceling out in the end anyway. Uh, but I'll call that delta A just so I can stay with my notes if nothing else. So let's see. So this force is sigma X prime delta A. That's actually the force on that face because that's what we need to balance. And this is tau x prime y prime delta A. So those are the forces now acting on those faces. We need to do the same thing for these other two faces. So this is, for example, this is sigma y sine theta delta A. Is that right? Because if that face is delta A, this face is sine theta delta A. And so uh, this, this stress, tau xy, acting on that same face, sine theta delta A. This stress is sin, uh, sigma x cosine theta delta A. And this stress right there, that's tau xy cosine theta delta A. So that's now all of the forces which we can balance not the stresses, which we can't balance. Well, we could if they were all acting on exactly the same area, but they're not. They, they, these now have the have possibility of different areas. I'll leave that up for now. All right, so that's our, that's our picture, our transformed element picture. And if we sum all the forces, And 
combine, and we're going to have several trig identities in here because we've got lots of cosines and sines and all kinds of stuff flying all over the place. So, um, and using trig identities. Um, occasionally in here, I do have one of those abnormal human beings that not only loves trig identities, but has every one of them in mind instantly on recall. Any of those people here? It's, it's certainly not me. So what we'll, we'll, this will be kind of like a hand-waving thing where I go hocus pocus, we do all this. It's all algebra, it's all trig identity. If you want to go through it, do so by all means. Um, it's not worth it for us to spend the time to do it here. So it comes down to then our ability to solve for these unknown stresses. Based upon the original stresses and the angle between the original angle and um, our new angle, whatever that may be. So the first part of it is that, then we've got sigma x minus sigma y over 2 times cosine 2 theta. So you, you recognize that as the type of place where these trig identities came in. Give me a little bit of space here to get the last piece in. Tau x y sine 2 theta. Now let me double check, make sure I got all my minus signs right, all the 2's right, all that kind of stuff. Plus there, minus there, cosine 2 theta, plus, yeah, there we go. Alright, so there's, there's the first of the equations. So now we can figure out what the stress is in any arbitrary angle. Remember, no change in load, just a change in our viewing angle. We now know what the axial stress is in that new direction. The second equation, not any particular order, we're going to need them all. The off angle shear stress is minus sigma x minus sigma y over 2. sine 2 theta plus tau xy, the original shear stress, cosine 2 theta. Hopefully you're getting a feeling of how much fun it would actually be to go through the derivation of these. Alright, let me double check this one. Minus, minus, sine, two theta, plus, x squared, cosine. Okay, we're all right. And then we need one last one. We've got sigma x prime, tau x prime, y prime. Now we need sigma y prime. Not actually on this picture, so we would have had to redo the picture a little bit to get that in there, but it's certainly doable but it's just an exercise in uh, a repetition. So again, this uh, equation opens with the average of the stresses, original stresses, minus sigma x minus sigma y over 2, cosine 2 theta, minus tau xy, sine 2 theta. All right, let me check that one. Average minus difference cosine 2 theta minus tau xy sine 2 theta. And we're all set. Now given any arbitrary angle, we can determine what the stresses are at, on an element at that angle. Exact same loading as before, all we've done is change our reference angle. 
And in a second, what we'll let this lead to, as you might imagine, is we'll ask ourselves, is there some angle where any of these maximize? Because that's then an angle of concern. If, if uh, on a particular angle, these get a maximum and go over the allowable limit, we need to pay attention to that because it means that these things could fail uh, in an off-angle direction rather than a strict uh, orthogonal direction. Um, not a big surprise when you see something that fails, when you see a, a, a piece of wood that breaks because it was bent too far or, or a, a, anything snaps because it was stretched too far. The, the interface that broke is not always nicely orthogonal. There's, there's angles to it. Um, because the stresses were greater at some angle than they were just in the straight across nice uh, 90 degree world in which we might prefer to live. Okay, so let's test drive this. Let's put it to the put it to the put it to the test here. So given some problem with some loading, just like we did yesterday, remember we had this bracket on the wall that we, uh, that we bent, we had, we had a problem that simply looked like that, that we did yesterday, and we, we looked at some elements back here and came up with an elemental loading on those. So very same type of thing we did there, I just happen to have some different numbers for it. So whatever loading it is we have gives us a, an axial stress in the x direction, a tensile of 10 megapascals. And some part of the loading gives us a compression of 5 megapascals in the uh, y direction. And a shear stress, and remember those are all the same all the way around, so all we need to do is give them a single number. So there's, there's the original loading. <coughs> and we want to find the off-angle stresses for 45 degrees. And we'll do that and then uh, redraw the element on that angle. Okay. Now, before you get jumping into this, we have to pay attention to some certain things. Obviously, we, we only need four things. We need the original stresses, the original normal stresses, we need the sh original shear stress, and we need the new angle. Well, the new angle, that's easy, there it is, it's 45 degrees, uh, so that'll, that'll be kind of simple. But make sure that you use the right original stresses because some are negative, and some are positive. And if you get those wrong, you're going to get the wrong picture for the new angle. So uh, that's the tensile stress sigma x. Uh, our convention has always been that tension is positive. So that values of 10 megapascals as it goes in the equation. The original Y normal stress, that's compression, that's negative, so we use a negative 5 megapascals. And then if you remember our convention for shear stress in this type of orientation where it's down on the right face and up on the left face, that convention is also negative. So 
tau xy is a negative 6 megapascals. And now you take a couple seconds just to run through these. If I were you, I would pay attention a little bit ahead of time. Notice that uh, the average shear stress you need to calculate for all of them. So just do that once as a separate thing, then you have it ready to plug in. We need the sort of the difference average, whatever you might call that. We'll need that in a couple of them. So just do that once and put it in. Um, just to save you a little bit of trouble, calculate those ahead of time. In fact, we can even label them as separate pieces. And maybe call this one sigma diff. Because we need that several times, so just calculate it once and then you're ready to just plug it in. minus signs right. Everything screws up if you miss those minus signs. that's important.
All set? Got some double checks going there. Everybody's okay? What's the new axial stress in the new x rex Remember, the loading didn't change at all. This still exists. We didn't take off any of the forces or add new forces or anything. This is, this is purely a geometric exercise. So what's uh, sigma x prime? Negative 3.5 megapascals. And y prime? 8.5, positive. And the shear stress? Negative, yeah, negative 7. 5 megapascal. So now we can redraw our new stress element. Let's see. Notice now in the x prime y prime or the x prime direction, we now have compression. That's a minus. Well, the minus is with the arrow, so that's just 3.5 plus your megapascals. Y prime. It is now 8.5 tension and we have a negative shear stress which is down on the x face up on the minus x face as our convention and that's uh, uh, what was it 7.5 Exact same loading, and clearly the stresses change quite a bit. Uh, the the nothing's changed in the element itself whatsoever. Just what we're looking at has changed, and now we can see that uh, there might be other places of concern um, that we hadn't seen before. Not a great change. We had. 10 in tension, now we only have 8.5, we have 5 in compression. Uh, the shear went up, could be that that's now over the allowable shear limit, and we'd have to design for that fact. Either change the load, change the geometry, or the type of thing that's very easy to do nowadays is uh, with carbon fiber that can be laid down at a particular angle, we can orient the carbon fiber to, to uh, protect for that type of thing. All right, uh, we'll, we'll do it real quick again for a new angle. Just uh, not that going through the calculations is any difficulty, but to make sure that we can view the, the new transfer element in the right way. this type of thing would be to do uh, just write a real simple computer program put in the original stresses put in the angle how it puts the new stresses so uh, you can find lots of calculators online for transformed
stresses. same numbers, then let's make sure we got the same transformed element. Okay, we ready? Got some, some checks and balances here. We're, we're ready to go public on these. Doobie, I can tell you're ready. What do I have? Sigma X prime. Somebody? 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 3.95. 3.95. Positive? Yep. Remember, that's uh, absolutely crucial to what we're looking at. Sigma Y prime, <laughs> didn't get that? Not even close. Well, that's what I got. That's why I put it up there in ink. I got committed to, to Patrick there. Uh, y prime, Sigma Y prime? 1.05. 1.05. And Tau XY? No, we disagreed. <laughs> 11.7. We do, we disagree. Yeah. Nine five. I had nine positive nine point five. Yeah. All right, again, watch the minus signs, they're really easy to mess up. Uh, you can save yourself, I think, a little bit of trouble if you calculate these two things ahead of time. Um, because then it's just every time you have to enter those you have a chance of messing up the minus signs. All right, so let's see what we've got here now. Uh, 90, we're, we're at, what, 120 degrees. So that's something like that. There's our new X prime direction. 1 Y prime is 90 degrees to that. So that's where our new element lays.
In the x prime direction, we have a positive just under 4. So, so we know that it's something like that. In the new y prime direction, we have about a fourth of that, but still positive. Now the shear stress is positive. Our convention is down on the positive x face is negative. So this is positive. It must be up on the positive x face. Here's the positive x face. That's the up direction on that face in the new transform coordinate system. And once you get one of them in, you can get the rest of them in. Uh, we now know that that shear is 9.5. And there's our new tran the transform stresses in the new coordinate direction. Pretty simple. You're stunned by how simple it is? Yes. Amazing, amazing, very simple. Very straightforward. Uh, let's see if I want to make the next step with it. Yeah, I think I'll go ahead and make the next step and then we can take that up again on, with, on Friday with that step. So, let me see. Let me see if I want to leave those up there. Well, let me clean off the problem stuff. Because that was just a, some individual problem. He's, he's, okay, we'll go ahead and keep this stuff here. All right, I've got equation one and two. If I square those and add them, And then simplify, you know, uh, combining like terms and canceling all the stuff that drops out, all that kind of stuff. We get down to this equation. Square one and two, uh, we get sigma x prime minus, oh, wait. Yeah, minus sigma average, which was the sigma x plus y over 2, quantity squared, minus tau x prime y prime squared, no, sorry, plus, plus tau x prime y prime squared, equals sigma x minus sigma y over 2 quantity squared. Sigma x, yep, that's right. Plus tau x y squared. Not that remarkable. Except if we look and see what we've got now. Uh, let's see. This little piece here is known. That comes from the original loading, the original uh, orthogonal direction. Same with this piece. No matter what the angle, you know those two because that's the orthogonal uh, regular original direction. 
these two things, that and that, are the variables, depending on what angle we pick. So these are each functions of theta. So I'm going to rewrite this equation a little bit. I'm going to call this beast here r squared. So I can rewrite this whole equation as sigma x prime, one of our variables, minus sigma average, just the average of the two stresses, quantity squared, plus the tau x y prime, the other variable, Pick a theta, that number's going to change. Sigma average won't. Equals r squared. Which is just a constant. You know what the original loading is? You know what r squared is. It's just, it's a, there's nothing that's going to change when you change angles. All right, I got all the pieces right. No plus or minus is missing. All right, here's the deal. And then this is where we'll end it and take it up on Friday. Uh, this is a variable. This is a variable. The other two stuff things is constant. So we could write it just in, in generic mathematical terms and then see if we recognize what this is. This, uh, we'll call it, this since, since sigma x prime is a variable, we'll call it x minus some constant we'll call A plus the other variable which we'll call Y because we like XY for variable names in, in mathematics equals R squared. Is that a functional form anybody recognizes? It's a circle. This is a circle with center at A, radius R. So tomorrow, or Friday then, we're going to take these, these uh, transformed elements and draw the circles that these lead to. This is called Moore's circle. And so we'll draw those and see what we can get out of the transformed stresses with uh, that visual aid then on Friday.